So with that, my duties are almost done. My last duty is to hand this off to Ken, who has kindly agreed to introduce Malcolm. Okay, so I want to speak uh, briefly and quickly because there's a lot uh, for us to digest. So um, we have uh, Malcolm Hobbs and Alicia Briggs today. Malcolm and his wife, Martha Campbell, have been among the longest and closest friends and allies of the democracy program here and uh, galvanized all kinds of involvement between uh, <coughs> Berkeley the University world and the wider uh, world of action. Malcolm has studied uh, with his medical degree at Cambridge uh, and served uh, in uh, actually in embry embryology, I believe, and uh, helped introduce uh, availability of contraception back in the time when it was uh, uh, hardly happening. Uh, he served in Planned Parenthood and then in, uh, in uh, Family Health International for many years and came to Berkeley as Bixby, became Bixby professor and uh, gathered the funding for the Bixby Institute and in more recent times has brought uh, <coughs> attention and uh, cooperation with the crises that are happening in the Sahel region and through the Oasis Initiative. And uh, Malcolm is one of the bravest people that I know in the wake of the wars in the Gulf. He went in uh, while the troops were still there trying to uh, guarantee provisions for women's health uh, under very hard conditions. He's traveled all over the world trying to support uh, women's health initiatives. Many countries, but most recently in the crisis area of Israel. And Alicia Graves uh, is uh, also uh, involved in the uh, uh, School of Public Health here and uh, in a Bixby based uh, non profit organization, Venture Strategies for Health and Development. Uh, and describes her work as aiming to help stabilize global population by upholding girls and women's rights. And, uh, in many cases, there's a lot of academic work in demography, and we sometimes forget how the issues that we talk about here affect in deep ways the lives of real people and uh, people in uh, deep crisis around the world. And uh, Malcolm and Martha and the Mixing Institute, and I'm sure Alicia too, are people who keep us making that link so that what we think about uh, connects with what happens to people in the world. So I welcome both of them. Does the Eurocentric theory of the demographic transition apply to Africa? Please tell us. Thank you for your generous introduction. It's always a genuine pleasure to come back to demography. Um, and it's, we're going to challenge the uh, important theory. Things to do with population and family planning seem to have got pushed off the table a little bit. So when I give lectures, I always get people to get a sense of scale. What is happening with a very rapid, uniquely rapid increase in global population? Who in this room is really working in the field of family planning and population, say for washing, what you want, aging and things? Two people. Yes, well, it could be different in the past. So, as we are challenging a sacred theory, I thought we'd be a bit biblical and divide up our talk into these issues. So, I think, as you all know, that Lauren Thompson was, I think, the first person to put the theory of demographic theory together, and then Bernstein uh, did it. And, you know, this is astonishing to me that Bradley Kirk says it's a, that one of the best generalizations in social sciences. That's what we're going to challenge, which makes it fun, doesn't it? <laughs> so, numbers. Um, they think when Warren Thompson and other people were working, we really had very limited data to go with. I mean, we had a Niagara of data about births and death rates and urbanization in Europe and North America. But we had much less information um, from what we now call the developing world, certainly from parts of Africa. And we really didn't know anything about what people did in their bedrooms, and we didn't know anything about the rates of safe abortion. And those are very, very important variables. So, um, so I, anyone know the work of Simon Schwetzer? He's at Cambridge University. 
We did provide sort of a very interesting survey asking sort of 80 year old women how did they plan their families in the, you know, in the past when they were young. And it was an interesting sort of study to do. And um, he made this statement, I think it's very true, that um, when you've made so many sort of addenda and caveats in relation to the theory that it's so flexible that as a cause of the explanation of change, it becomes empirically irrefutable. I think that's a nice description. So, I think that we all know that there are huge differences in the way in which cultures put together uh, mating, age of um, when people can marry, forms of marriage, etc. So, the differences between Europe and North America, which is really where the um, demographic transition was sort of outlined, are um, very large indeed. I mean, we work in Muslim communities with polygamy, with child marriage, and extended families. An extended family is fundamentally different from a nuclear family. Um, many of you know the work of Tony Wrigley on historical demography in England. Uh, Queen Elizabeth made vicars record the person best of everybody in their parish and you could reconstitute um, the, the history of, of, of families in rural England in those recent times. And people were getting married very late. And they were having relatively few children spaced by long intervals of breastfeeding. And that kind of thing is totally different. It's light years removed from what's happening in the, in the Sahel today. And then um, Africa is much more heterogeneous than, Russia, than, um, than North America and Europe. So if you had a standard thing about the demographic transition which might work in Europe and North America, some parts of it might work in Africa but not in other parts. So, um, and it interests me when demographers who name recognition I'm sure you have say things. Um, Don Dungox, we all admire him, but he says the success of organized family planning programs in Asia and Latin America demonstrates there's no tight link between development indicators and fertility. And he goes on to say really that demographic transition doesn't work, but it should work, and I still like it. So um, I think it's had some good ac academic uh, criticisms. Um, I think also it was a driver of the way in which policies in my field of family planning were, were developed. So Note Stein was president of the Population Council and put together a lot of things in relation to the early policies. He was buying in to the um, demographic transition. Kingsley Davis was critically imp important here because when programs began to be funded by USAID, he wrote a paper in Science which said there's no reason to expect that millions of decisions about family size made by couples in the interest will automatically control population for the benefit of society. On the contrary, there's good reason I think it will not. And he was very invested in demographic transition theory and basically said it's not going to work and that caused a lot of pushback in, in, um, in, in, in Congress. These are two people that I respected very much. Um, Ray Redmond Holder still alive. He was the leader of international family planning, and he spent a year at Berkeley. I think it's probably the alum that's had the most influence on the world that we now live in. Um, and Bill Draper was a, a general, a friend of Eisenhower, and moved a lot of things in Congress. So this is how the work that um, I'm interested in was sort of pushed forward, and there was a lot of money, a lot of money in America. I came to America in 1978, because this is where the was the epicenter of things to do with international uh, family planning. So, we said Kingsley Davis wrote an article in... Kingsley Davis was here, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, he wrote this 1966 thing in Science saying, family planning programs are quackery or wishful thinking. And the conservatives in Congress said, wow, we didn't put any money in family planning. Ray Ravenholt said, it seems reasonable to believe that when men and women throughout the world need only reproduce when they choose, 
than the many intense family and social problems generated by unplanned, unwanted, and poorly cared for children would be greatly ameliorated. I think that um, Ray was wrong and Kinsey Davis was right. Was, that Ray was right and Kinsey Davis was wrong. So, I think the demographic transition did produce problems in the way in which people framed family planning policies. And if you believed um, that um, meeting the young need for family planning, which is my philosophy and, and, and Alicia's work, that was very different from other people who said, well, it's going to be a demographic transition. Some of them said, you don't need to do anything. Just wait and the problem will solve itself. <laughs> but um, I think some of these Karen's saying, um, after the Bucharest conference said, at the Bucharest conference said, development is the best contraceptive. A few years later, he went back to India and did a coercive interval of family planning, which I think was quite uh, unacceptable, and I think was built in part on the demographic transition theory, because that theory was emphasizing um, wealth and education as drivers of small families. And he said, we're not going to get wealth and education in India, so we better tell people what to do. And that led to coercion. And I think that was really very sad. So I will stop there and pass it on to Alicia so we can move quickly. Hi there. Um, I realized we forgot so there are some students in the audience and probably some people not from a demography background. So just um, we should have defined what is the demographic transition theory. And it's a theory that um, at mortality and fertility um, in most in societies in the past were both very high. And usually the pattern is that mortality falls and then fertility follows. And the theory is that mortality, so it's the transition from high fertility and mortality to low fertility and mortality. And um, just one thing regarding the venture strategies for health and development, um, as Ken said, we are trying to help stabilize global population by upholding girls' and women's rights. And just to note by what that means, um, especially right to education, um, right to freedom from marriage as a child, uh, right to access to family planning and safe abortion. So let's look at a little bit more about um, what's happening in Sub-Saharan Africa and more specifically in the Sahel. I hope you can see the distinction in colors, but um, you can see that Sub-Saharan Africa and parts of um, other, other parts of uh, the Middle East still have very high fertility of four or more. Um, and this is even harder to see the distinction, but the dark red colors are fertility of um, greater than six. And so at the time, this was from The Economist, uh, but based on work by John May and Jean-Pierre Gagnon, um, I think Niger, Chad, Mali, Congo are the countries with fertility greater than six. Um, and I just get this, this data. Um, these are the states in northern Nigeria that um, the Sahel Belt um, passes through. And you can see, um, as the UN defines high fertility of five or more, um, almost all of the states in northern Nigeria are considered high fertility. So for those of you who don't know much about the, the context in Nigeria, the south is Christian and the north is mostly Muslim, and they are very, very different in terms of uh, economic development and culture and fertility. Um, Africa is the region with the highest adolescent birth rate, and I was just reading that um, there's more and more evidence supporting that when countries have uh, enforced laws about uh, the age of marriage at 18, that there's a dramatic, it's correlated with a dramatic drop in the adolescent birth rates. Which is, and so a lot of the countries in the Sahel and Central Africa don't have those laws in place. Um, I found this interesting. After the, so every two years, the UN puts out new population projections. And at least in the last version, they put out these fact sheets that go along with it. And I find it kind of strange. This is a direct quote from it. But uh, the end of high, thus, the end of high fertility is near and should become a reality within the next decade or so, according to the results of this revision, but in the, inherent in the revision are some um, very major assumptions about what's going to happen to fertility in some of these um, poor parts of the world. So um, Malcolm and I both picked up the, the term wishful thinking, but 
Um, I think this is a very, so these are the uh, assumptions about fertility from the um, 2017 um, revision of the projections, and you can see a really drastic rate. I wish I had put it up against, they also assume, they basically assume that countries are going to nearly converge by the end of the century at replacement level fertility, and Malcolm and I are putting forth that. That's not reasonable to think in the, in the context of some of the countries in Western and Central Africa. Uh, let's see, where, where is the data and where is the projection? Is it coming? So, yeah, good question. It's about so that last point, here. That's kind of the last point, see? Okay. And um, the, the projections are revised, uh, like I said, every two years. And in terms of, especially for African countries in the Sub-Saharan Africa region, the projections are regularly revised upwards. So I just found a demographer named Romaniuk. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right. Um, but I was reading a paper he wrote about the Congo. And it, so, he, so in 2008, he said the population projection for the DRC was, well, was 148 million. So I looked at what is the, pop, the current population projection for 2050, it's 197 million. So within this period of 10 years, the UN has revised upwards the population projection for 2050, which is now not that far off, by 49 million, which is about a third of the original projection. Um, this is, excuse me, I should have first said that this is the um, 19, uh, sorry, uh, the blue line is the 1998 um, pro uh, UN projection for Sub-Saharan Africa um, ending at uh, about 1.52 billion by 2050 and the latest projection, the medium variant projection is 2.17 by 2050. So it's really dramatic increases. Um, so, I just um, wanted to say, so Caldwell and et and, and al. Um, put forth that there really is a, a, a new type of fertility transition happening in Africa, and that was from 2000 and, oh sorry, from 1992. Um, but they were concluding that the fertility decline had begun and it would continue and spread. Um, but Romaniuk's analysis is that it's, tr it's true for some parts, but we think, we, we know more about the Sahel, we've been looking at the Sahel more carefully, but the more I see about Middle Africa, or Central Africa, um, it is also part of this special case, and I'll just say that uh, the Sahel is an ecological transition zone, it's, it's Arabic, for the Arabic word for sure, it's basically the southern border of the Sahara Desert. <clears throat> as it turns to grassland, and it passes through the widest part of the African continent from Senegal and Mauritania are included over to Ethiopia and Eur a little bit of Eritrea here, and the northernmost part of Nigeria falls into it. This is from Niger, the country just above Nigeria, and um, this is the population, uh, historical population growth from the 1960s to present day. This is the population projection by middle of the uh, century, it's the fastest growing country in the world. Um, although I suspect if northern Nigeria were its own country, it would be, it, it would have the same pattern. Um, in the serial, you can see a small, but um, uh, doesn't seem to be <coughs> keeping pace with the population growth. <clears throat> and this is in the context of a region that is re regularly suffers from droughts followed by famines. Um, so what I find interesting about this is it seems to be the only, um, this is from a special series in the Population and Development Review last year on the fertility transition in Sub-Saharan Africa, but um, Casterlin points out that Middle and West Africa are the only region where the desired ide mean ideal number of children is greater than the fertility rate in the country. And these are the population pyramids for Niger. And what I want to show you here from the same paper is just that in other parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, as parity increases, so does the percent of women who say they want to know more children. So the, the, the solid line is a parity of two, then parity of four, then parity of six. You can see, I see a, some of them tend to be uh, not increasing much over more recent periods of time. But what I think is very interesting is the case of Niger and Mali is rather close to it. 
Um, in Niger, there's just a persistent desire for large families. Um, and some of the explanations for that, Jenna has actually written about. Um, but I find that pretty striking. The, the, there's something um, very important to know about the context. This is from a World Bank um, book called Voice and Agency that analyzes um, country by country deprivations um, that women um, and girls uh, suffer. And sadly, Niger is, is what I say is the textbook example because this is the one that's called out in the introduction as a country where, a place where only 1% of women don't fall into one or more of these um, domains of child marriage or lacking control or condoning white feeding. Uh, on the bright side, and I think this was what Malcolm wanted me to talk about when he suggested I talk on revelations, is we do know some things that can work. Even though the context is different, we expect that uh, delaying marriage, especially by keeping girls in school, can be effective. And some colleagues of ours, and now Oasis is starting to offer this in Niger, um, other colleagues have been super successful in northern Nigeria helping keep girls in school, and the transition rate has jumped 20-fold. Um, transition of girls from primary to secondary school. The age of marriage in northern Nigeria where we've been doing these safe space programs for girls has increased by two and a half years. So that's among the Hausa people, which is the largest ethnic group in West Africa. Um, a large part of the population in Niger is also Hausa, and so we expect and we've been doing formative research that suggests it, that this program will be successful in that country as well. Um, even though there's a high, a, a, uh, demand for large families, there's also an unmet need for family planning in all of the Sahel countries, and it's about two to three times, as country by country average, it's about two to three times greater unmet need for family planning than there are current users. And unmet need is defined as um, women who say that they would like to stop having children or space by two years their next pregnancy, but they're not using modern contraception. Um, this was developed for a conference that Malcolm got started, and I came in, um, uh, I got involved in it. This is sort of the birth of the OASIS initiative. Um, we, Malcolm had been looking at population growth. So this is actually uh, the population of the Francophone Sahel countries plus Sudan and Eritrea. We didn't include Ethiopia and Nigeria, but we now have more specific population data from Nigeria, so we're going to be redoing this. But so this is the population of um, Senegal, Mauritania, Niger, Mali, Chad, Burkina, Sudan, and Eritrea. Uh, historically, this was in 2010, actually. This is the tw 2050 projection as of, I think, 2015, and the end of century projection. And this is the um, increase in air surface temperature, and it's expected to get about uh, uh, two and a half degrees hotter by middle of the century, degrees Celsius and about uh, nearly six degrees Celsius hotter by end of the century. So um, OASIS has now established as a civil society. We're a project of the Bixby Center at Berkeley, as was said. Um, we're a project of my own organization, which is called Venture Strategies for Health and Development, which was started by Malcolm's wife, Martha Campbell. Um, and we are now a registered civil society organization led by our colleague, Nuhu Abdul Mumuni, who has a PhD in demography from, from Geneva, University of Geneva. Um, this is our team. This was taken in the MA last year. And we're doing um, operations, operations research on programs for girls and family planning, but also leadership program for people working in these fields. And this is a very basic um, graphic, but I think it's, um, as Ken said earlier, trying to link, for those of you who are in the field of demography, trying to link the numbers with actually with people's lives. This is a region that is uh, chronically um, hit by, by famine, um, and so through these, what we call three pillars, we expect we can improve yields, but also slow population growth, so that it's easing the demand for food. And we're always looking for graduate student volunteers. Um, some especially of you know, if you speak French. Especially if you speak French, <laughs> absolutely. And I worked on um, Project Drawdown, which is a very interesting uh, project trying to identify ready -made, solutions that are ready to be implemented um, that can draw down emissions in the atmosphere. And um, Malcolm and I, with another grad student, worked on uh, linking family planning and girls' education to slower population growth, which 
by slowing population growth could have the largest effect on emissions. Um, and here's a shot from northern Nigeria where we've been doing the safe space programming. So thanks very much, and we have plenty of time for discussion. Does the, is the fertility rate uh, offset by mortality rate? Uh, uh, you have those statistics to do for that region? I don't see there's any connection. <coughs> I don't see any empirical evidence that there's a connection. I know demographic transition says that falling um, infant mortality reduces family size. And Bill Gates said that. And then several of us got together, including I think John Bungarts, and showed him data from Africa where that's not true. It is a correlation in much of Asia, but it's not a correlation in Africa. I don't think it's a driving force. Well, no, I mean, I mean, how does it affect the population growth? I mean, you, you, you have it's been, yes, it's been enormously driven because it's so easy to vaccinate children and not dying. Mm. I mean, the Sahel has cultures that have faced um, famine and droughts for thousands of years. They're very resilient uh, cultures and they have quite large families. And then when you stop, when, and a very high infant mortality. That infant mortality has been removed and that's what's mm -hmm. trying it's to happen. It's been greatly, yeah, greatly reduced. So the infant mortality in Niger is about 8%. So it's still nowhere near the developed world, but it's come down to the extent that the population growth <coughs> in Niger is the fastest in the world. Mm -hmm. And so it's very painful, you know, to recognize the fact that if you do a lot, which is very easy and cheap to do, to reduce infant mortality, without a concomitant investment in family planning, you end up with greater pain and suffering. Because the crisis by mid-century in the Sahel is 300 million people watching their crops wither and their cattle die. There will be unprecedented involuntary migration, a lot of it to Europe. Europe politics have been changed by the migration that's taken place in the last few years. This is a geopolitical crisis that will affect all of us. And I would ask people in this room, if you're young and you're wondering what to do about your thesis in demography, pay some attention to this area, please, because it's going to be so important for everybody, including you as young people. And just one other thing about the child mortality is it's, child mortality, as you know, has come down around the world, including Sub-Saharan Africa, but the rates of child stunting in 10 of the Sub-Saharan African countries are actually on the rise. So we're saving children's lives, but we're not, you know, it's related to nutrition. We're not, you know, able to ensure that they have adequate nutrition. So I think that's quite a, um, you know, a sad fact. And uh, the other... Um, so I wanted to say one other thing. Malcolm has been predicting that mortality will rise among more vulnerable groups in this part of the world um, because it's hard to keep up. There's already huge gaps in healthcare, right, in this part of the world. So they have to make up the gap, but then keep up with the rate of pace of population growth. So Malcolm's been predicting that for a while. Um, I just saw that even though Bill Gates used to say that they were that it would necessary um, low in the declining mortality would necessarily also um, declining fertility would follow the gates have changed their mind on this and they have a goalkeepers report where they're watching progress towards the sustainable development goals and in the report that they just released last October um, they acknowledge that rapid population growth is a threat to achieving these sustainable development goals in sub-saharan Africa and they're not investing in the level that they should be yeah. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> you didn't present a number of slides about the progress that I take it is being made in some of this region and the expansion of women's education. Um, last month, a uh, controversial paper appeared in uh, the NAS in which Ocon uh, Lutz, uh, in Vienna, um, argued that some of the slowdown, the stalling of fertility trans transitions in the Sahel and Sub-Saharan Africa dates from the economic crisis of the uh, uh, 1990s, uh, which undermined the early primary events in early primary education 
for the women who are now in prime childbearing ages. So there was, <coughs> he claimed, a slowdown in progress in women's education that is now affecting the progress in uh, uh, toward lower fertility. But he drew a kind of <coughs> hazy, optimistic view that the period of whatever it was called, somewhat past, and that uh, later cohorts uh, will be coming now into childbearing age who had better access to, uh, to uh, also women's education. Stuff. Now, women's education is a mixed blessing, I guess, in Africa. I know Jenna has written and studied extensively. The content of education matters as well as the years there. But do you see any credence to this story? Is there I, I think an optimistic some, piece? There's, there's some credence, that. but it still doesn't look at the critical issue. I have a lot of degrees after my name. It does not affect my sperm count. That's a fact. It's also a joke. You don't seem to have much sense. <laughs> so, people won't look at the essential things. The default position for any normal heterosexual couple is a large family. Queen Victoria had nine children. She hated having children. She was the richest woman in the world and very well educated, but she had no access to contraception. And so we have to put much more emphasis on taking contraception and voluntary sterilization and safe abortion to these places. If we don't do that, nothing's going to happen. And Lutz can say quite nicely these very nice uh, graphs about education. But there is no plausible way that Niger or Burkina are going to catch up with education at the rate at which people are coming. They can't build schools fast enough when you've got a population half of which is under the age of 15. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. Um, so, it also seems like, yeah, like Niger has like extremely low, all, most women of childbearing age want to have more children. Are you kind of arguing that the introduction of contraception is going to start changing those attitudes? Um, it's only, first of all, we've got to look at things that we can do. Um, Clementine Rossiter, who did her PhD here, studied abortion in Burkina Faso, a neighboring country, and I think there were something like 100,000 unsafe abortions every year. That tells me, as a gynecologist, that somebody wants to plan their family. It also tells me we are not giving people the contraceptive choices to which they would respond. Yeah. I was asked by Belinda Gates to brief her before she went to Niger in 2012. And John May and I talked about population and things. I thought she'd be interested in Gates. I bet she'll put some money into family planning in that area. They've done that very late and in a very tepid sort of way. People are somehow rather frightened about something to do with family planning. Yes? So I have a question about sort of agency in this. And what is, there seems to be no or little incentive for many women, if they're saying they want six or seven or eight children to limit their fertility. Second is, how much of this should be a government responsibility, and specifically the governments in those countries? And, and what has been your understanding of why they are not driving fertility planning programs? Well, some of the um, people in the government have got four wives, and they, they're telling John May it's so stupid to have a 12 year old bride. You know, some of them are very sensible, some of them aren't. So, um, we, it, it's just that we, we're, not offering, we're not trying to do those things that we, that we need to do. When I first went to Bangladesh, people were having six children, on average. I never met anybody who said they wanted to have two children. But a lot of people said, oh, perhaps I'll have four. When they had four, people said, oh, the kids are going to school, perhaps I'll have three. Now, they have 2.4, a huge transition driven by making family planning and safe abortion available. Can I add a couple, <clears throat> a couple points? Is that the, um, so some of the donors, like including the Gates, um, USA, the Hewlett Foundation, um, I think the Canadian um, CETA, uh, and others got together about, I don't know, eight or ten years yes. ago and said there is something, West Africa has been, you know, systematically overlooked for family planning and reproductive health. Um, investment. So they have tried to 
jumpstart something there, um, and including working very closely with the governments to try to get more ambitious plans. I think in the case of Niger, it's been overly ambitious. They were trying to get the CPR to 50% by 2020. That was a target that they set in the early 2010s, when the CPR is currently, I think, 12% so uh, the contraceptive prevalence rate. So the governments have, um, have very um, varying, admitting that it's, it's varied, but a lot of the governments in the region have policies in place and are trying to put some of their own monies in towards uh, family planning services. But again, it's, it's a little bit, I know from friends in Niger, they say, I don't know how many children Isufu, who is the president of Niger, has, but he does have two wives. Um, and a lot of the politicians are known to have large families, and so people find it hard to swallow that they're now, you know, telling, they are, Yusuf has made public statements about, um, uh, for example, linking um, passages from the Quran with, um, you know, being responsible parents and only having the children that you can afford. Um, so he is outspoken on this. Um, and I don't know much about the, what's happening in, in northern Nigeria, but usually the, um, the local leaders tend to be the wealthiest people, the village chiefs and such, and they tend to have large families as well. So it's, it's a hard thing to get um, politicians to, to speak in a credible way on. But one thing regarding the person who asked about education is um, we looked at the, the fertility rates compared to girls who had some primary versus girls who had second, some secondary school. And it's about, for all of the countries in the Sahel, there's about two um, children difference. So it is really important, um, but uh, the, the secondary, uh, secondary school enrollment rate for girls in Niger is 14%. So there's still a really long way to go. And like Malcolm said, you know, there, we have to kind of bridge the existing gap, but then keep up with the rate of population growth, which means building more schools, deploying and paying more teachers, et cetera. Um, and I think that's going to be very, very hard in this context. We've already heard that in Niger, they're now dividing the days. Uh, the teachers can't handle the class load, so they have some, they've divided the class in half. So half the kids are coming in the morning and half the kids are coming on the af in the afternoon. So you can think of what that does for the quality of education, um, and it may have an effect on what, how, what will be different about those girls who do go to secondary school when that quality is poor. If you want, sorry. There's one statistic to remember. John Bongard's Nature article a few years ago said that 1% of foreign aid, as measured by the OECD, goes to family planning. 1%. If we had 2%, we would solve probably, in my experience, based on 50 years, if we could double it from 1% to 2%, I think we'd solve many of these problems. There isn't enough money. People don't understand the gravity of the situation. And people don't understand how women will respond to choices when it gives them to it. When I went to um, northern Nigeria, I thought it would be impossible to keep girls in secondary school. I thought it would be impossible 10 years ago to raise the age of marriage. The age of marriage has gone from 14.9 to 17.5. That's a giant leap for an adolescent girl. I'm delighted and thrilled to be surprised. I'm sure we could be delighted and thrilled to see similar gains in family planning prevalence if we would make the investment. Yes. Um, so I don't work in the region, but assuming, well, so I just Googled the life expectancy in the region. It looks like it's 46, overall life expectancy is 46 years old. So if I were a woman living in that region, the disease-free life expectancy is going to be even lower, right? Yeah. So if I see people getting ill and dying, let's say late 30s, mid 30s, it would all, and there are no social safety nets in place for people that are elderly in their late 30s, then it would be rational for me to want, let's say, six children, a couple of them will die off, and then the rest will take care of me when I'm diseased and 40. Um, so I wonder how much of the, I mean, I completely understand and agree with your message, but I wonder how much of the, how much of the puzzle is family planning and how much of it is old age social safety nets and support in conjunction with each other. Well, family planning is the missing bit. When they try it in other places, it's always worked very well. But the other bits are not there, right? Like the elderly are not supported. Their social safety nets are still their families. That was the same in Bangladesh when I started. After the, after the war in Bangladesh, it was terribly poor. It was a very conservative society. 
the things changed. You just strode in there and they found it by then, say, for abortion. I do think, let me say something about that. I do think, um, sorry, what was the reaction? Well, the elderly. So what happened to the elderly in Bangladesh? Like, I feel like the two things are linked. Because they families are linked people, to people do teachers. cite um, cite their own security yeah. in their older years as a reason for wanting large families. So yeah. there's something to that. Um, I don't know. You said it's rational. I don't know how rational it is because what they're finding is they they have historically had very um, um, their livelihoods were quite defined based on their ethnic group and houses tended to be smallholder farmers. The Tuaregs tend to move around a lot. Some of them raise cattle, etc. They're now really diversifying in what they do because they're finding that they're not able to support their family with whatever means of livelihood they have traditionally had. And so some of them are now dabbling in the other, you know, uh, farming, or farming people are trying pastoralism. It's common to send uh, a couple of children into the cities to see if they can eke out a living there. But um, the, so I don't know if it's that rational because they're, they're, the, the depth of poverty is increasing. Um, and the, the plots of land for the farmers, of course, is getting smaller. Um, so, because it's divided by, uh, between children. So the children are inheriting um, smaller and smaller plots of land. So anyhow, it is a consideration, but I don't think that explains everything. I don't think that's how people work. I don't think people are making rational decisions. A man wants sex with his wife, literally kicks her out of bed and goes to sleep. That's the reality. She doesn't know how to stop getting pregnant. In one, I saw a study from northern Nigeria. You have a 1% chance of dying every time you have a baby. Women have a 1 in 12 lifetime chance of dying in childbirth. 1 in 12. You have a 1 in 12,000 chance in this place if you're a woman. That's obscene. And that should say women are not going to get pregnant. They don't look at that. Their husband screws them throws him out of bed and he goes to sleep. That's what sex is about for lots of people. And we've got to give the woman choices. I'd like to hear more about that. I think I'd like to hear <laughs> 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 well, I, mean, I, I study international migration, but I'm really interested in understanding migration over the life, of course, the life over the life cycle. And I'd like to, I guess, you know, a lot of the story is really very realistic and it makes us very concerned for not just our own future, but for the world's future, and certainly all that we're hearing about climate change, all that we know. I'd like to hear a little bit more about the safe space programming, maybe? Like, what, what are the ways that things are actually shifting um, that you feel? And then, just so if you guys can have, have more ideas about, you talk about the heterogeneity of the region, and so I do both work in Senegal and work in Ethiopia, so I'm kind of the ends a little bit more than the middle, but just. A little more about the heterogeneity, a little bit related to um, Leora's question about, um, like in Ethiopia, for example, there's a national system of healthcare centers, right? And and you can imagine that kind of having that kind of infrastructure really changes how adolescent boys and girls are able to make decisions. So, I'm sorry, multiple kind of questions. I could talk about safe spaces. One thing somebody asked about whether there could be some kind of whether the unmet need is a moving target, it was the gentleman who's left, but um, just a quick anecdote, and then I'll talk about uh, safe spaces and try to say something about the heterogeneity. Um, there, was a, there was a big push to have um, improved access to the injectable contraceptive and in Niger, so they've been doing pilot testing to see what are the lowest level health providers that could do this safely. In Niger, they found they could do this at the uh, uh, health huts um, and so they have, so, and they coupled this, um, the PATH was the one who started, I forgot who the implementing partner, but it was working with government of Niger. They coupled the availability of the injectable with a pretty aggressive radio campaign to inform women that there's a new type of contraceptive that's safe and effective and you can get it here. What they found was that in Niger, in rural Niger, 70% of the women who came for that in, uh, injectable contraceptive were first-time users. So to me, that's incredibly hopeful because it says that there is this latent demand and when you give women information and an easy way to access it, that they will come. Um, regarding the safe spaces, uh, it's a, a safe space is a group, um, it basically is defined as it's a group of about 15 to 18 um, girls. So we've been targeting girls who are in their last year of primary school. We've also run some safe space programs for out-of-school girls. 
but it's a place where they can get together um, in a relatively quiet and peaceful um, environment with a mentor. Ideally, she would be from the community. Um, and Safe Spaces, by the way, have been very successful in Ethiopia as well. It's the population council who got them started there. Um, but we're, so she has a, a mentor, and basically, um, we have found for the girls who are in school, first, we need to reinforce literacy and numeracy because even though they're going to school, they're still not able to read or write. And that's a huge disincentive for the parents to continue sending their girls to school because there are opportunity costs involved. So they get reinforced, their academics are reinforced during the first half of the meeting. They meet um, once weekly. They're like girls' clubs, if you will. And then during the second half, they learn about life skills, which um, includes nutrition, it includes reproductive health, um, it includes um, things like getting a national identity card, um, negotiation. So one of the stories that Daniel tells is that after a few years of doing this, he heard that the, the parents were saying, oh, we're so happy with these safe space clubs. Our girls are much more obedient. And Daniel and Habiba, his partner there, were like, that's not what we're aiming for. That's quite the opposite. So they dug deeper and found what they mean by that is that the girls are more able to um, articulate their uh, desires to their parents and discuss things with them in a rational and, and often convincing way. And it's especially effective around marriage, when, who they're going to marry, when they're going to marry. But um, they learned how to negotiate, and so the parents actually, in the end, appreciated that. Um, about the difference, that, so some of the heterogeneity, like I said, is in, based on ethnic groups and tradition, traditional livelihoods. Um, but by country, on a country by country basis, the health systems are very different. I just saw numbers for community health workers by country, and some countries look very good on paper. Like Burkina Faso actually has a lot of community based agents, but in terms of what they are allowed to offer, um, it's, they tend to be restrictive um, for contraceptive method mix. And, uh, and in Niger, and I, and I think this will be the same in northern Nigeria, there's a large preference for, in other parts of the world, like Malcolm has cited, the community-based approach to family planning has worked very, very well. But in Niger, it's uh, very private, um, and women would prefer not to have people come into their house because they don't want their neighbors and friends to gossip about them. So they often make up stories about why they need to go to a health agent. Um, <laughs> They'll bring their child along to get a, an injection so that people will think that they're there for a well child visit. So it, the approach that's going to work for family planning will be different. And I think it will be very different in Niger and northern Nigeria. I, I had a question about the uh, people on the ground involved in this. Is there, you've been talking about the men as obstacles to this, is there a local set of men who are advocating these programs, and how, how does that play out uh, on the ground, or is it mostly the people from other countries that are coming in? They have a, yeah, there's the, there's the Husband Schools, which is some program that the UNFPA tried to start in Mauritania. It wasn't very successful there. It's gotten a lot of attention in Niger, and I have seen that these are, these are schools um, informal groups of men who are, um, they choose a leader based on somebody who has used the formal health services, um, somebody who, I don't know how they, um, somebody who doesn't mistreat their wife, I guess the village would know about that. There are a few other criteria, and then these men lead discussion groups with other men from the village. So for participants in that, the contraceptive prevalence has increased, but, and hopefully that's voluntary. Um, uh, the other thing about men is they're not always a barrier. There's some um, very interesting work that was done by a group called uh, the Cambridge, uh, it used to be Hope Consulting, now it's Cambridge Collective, and they did a bunch of surveys in Niger and found that actually women underestimate support from their partner about family planning services, but there's very, very little communication between women and men. And so if you see your husband, and so a lot of women um, will not do things without their husband's permission, if you're not able to talk about family planning, um, and you tend to think that they would be less supported than they actually are, then that's a really bad combination of factors. And I think something else that could work in this context is looking for ways to um, sort of break the taboo around discussing decisions around fertility and family planning between couples. And then what about at, kind of at the uh, more academic and uh, uh, executive level, these planning, planning, planning programs, so for example, in Nigeria, are 
I guess you, you had a mention of the, the politicians having a lot of children and then somehow preaching to their citizens. Yeah. Well, don't don't behave like that. Don't do as I do. Do as I say. Uh, is there is there is there a Nigerian Malcolm Potts who has a has the microphone and is doing this? Are we are trying to like find the Nigerian Malcolm Potts and new <laughs> Malcolm Wumi, who is the is the closest I've, um, we've come. But uh, he's the man leading Oasis from Niger. There are we have a leadership program that we've actually based on the environmental <laughs> leadership program at the College of Natural Resources. And the aim is to have a critical mass of leaders working on family planning. We've expanded it now to include safe abortion and girls' education and women's empowerment. And so we've, we're, we have run it for four years. We're taking uh, mid-career, early and mid-career professionals from across the Francophone Sahel who are working on these things, and we're really trying to promote their communications and advocacy skills, but also to see the links between population and development, which is often, for people working on family planning, they're dealing with, for example, we've had some doctors from Marie Stokes. We've even had some doctors from the government services come, and they're, ta they're talking with women or couples um, on a one-to-one -one basis, and they haven't really made the link that, for all of the development work that's going on in Sub-Saharan Africa, family planning is going to be the most critical, because none of the other efforts to provide clean water or food or education, et cetera, are going to work if the population growth continues as it is. So they're very empowered to, to learn this. So there are some, yes. Oh, this is a very elementary question. Because I, we give money to um, population media, media center, yes. which you know about. So the question is, do they have television? How do we get the norms into these villages yeah. that you well, don't have to see? They can't always afford the, the batteries, but they can get solar panels to recharge things. So they don't have and there's good studies out of, I think, Burkina, isn't it, where the radio stations have relative, these are huge countries, but there is little range. So they're able to do a sort of case control trial of messages about family planning and things, and they could measure a very significant increase in the number of people coming to clinics. And so radio, I think, is very powerful. And it tends, they tend to, these are some of the most rural countries in the world. Um, and so radios tend to be available in the, in the far out places, and they have been, yeah, they have been effective. But regarding changing norms, the other example um, I just want to give back to the Safe Space program is, when we started in northern Nigeria, people there were just four percent of girls going to secondary school. So you can imagine those girls really stood out. They all wore uniforms, right? So people were gossiping about the parents, especially the fathers of those girls, saying, "Okay, he means well, but he's really putting his girl at risk, or she's going to be westernized, and she's going to she is at uh, increased risk for sexual harassment and assault because she's going out into the community and into these schools. Often it means going to a different community altogether." There was a lot of gossip about those families that had their girls in secondary school. So fast forward about eight years, and now it's 20-fold increase. So it went from 4 to 82%, I think, of girls who are enrolled, 87% of girls now enrolled in secondary school. So now the families are gossiping about those parents who are not sending their girls to secondary school. So I think that's a pretty radical change. And another change in norms that we've seen is in these housing communities, women are, tend to be secluded, so they're kept. Um, you can say they're kept, or they, they choose to uh, stay inside their family compound once they're compound once they're married, and so that's been going on for at least a couple hundred years. Jenna probably knows how long, but it's it's been a, it, that has been the norm for many generations that once a woman is married, she should stay inside her compound unless she has some special reason to go out and with permission from their husband. Now. Um, Originally, the mentors who were supposed to come from the communities, we had a hard time finding literate girls from these communities, so they were, we were taking them from the larger towns or cities. Now there's a cohort of girls who have gone through the safe spaces, they are literate, and they have totally broken this norm of staying inside the compound because they are working as mentors for the safe space club. So there's a cohort of over a dozen women, I think Dennis said about two dozen women, young women who are working outside of the of the compound for the first time in generations. So I think that's pretty incredible. Uh, also, like a, I know it's a very complicated story, but and it's interesting that you brought up the example of Bangladesh because uh, I come from Pakistan and we have heard this example so many times that Bangladesh has successfully invested in family planning and they have been successful in reducing their birth rate and this is what Pakistan should do. 
And the interesting story, at least like from our context, and I think this will speak to this context as well, is that uh, even though there has been significant investment in Pakistan from like the 1960s in family planning, and contraceptives are much, much cheaper than they are, in, for example, in the US or any of the developed countries, they're almost free. The frustration is that access to contraceptions or making contraception cheap is not reducing birth rates. Women are still choosing to have uh, a great number of children. So I don't know, like it just makes me a bit uncomfortable that maybe there is something else that's also going on in terms of why women choose to have more children and maybe it's just not a simple story of lack of contraception access leading to women having more children. So, but, yes. so in this case of Pakistan, do you, well I don't want to ask you to speak for the woman in the country, but part of it is are they able to discuss this with their partners? Are they able to discuss when to have sex and whether to use contraception? Because if they aren't, then they'll have, the default will be to have a large family. Sure, sure, I understand that, but I think like maybe the way the family planning programs are uh, articulated should also take into account like understanding just a why it, and maybe it's not simply that women don't want to have children and it's it's an impediment with their partner. So I don't know, like maybe I, and I don't know the answer for this because I can't speak for say women in Pakistan or any women for that matter. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> for one. <laughs> but I think like it's maybe there needs to be like in even in family planning programs there needs to be more concerted effort in understanding the decisions that lead women to have more children, except for just like simply saying that oh the maybe it's because they've not been able to discuss this, or it's yeah. simply an issue of action. respect, there's 200,000 Pakistani women are going to tell us something very important this year. They risk their lives having unsafe abortions. Anybody that's going to sell anything should be able to get out to those people that have contraceptives there. If there isn't the organization or the money to do it. And the other thing, the most, what, what, let me ask this group. Which country on this planet had the most rapid decline in fertility in the last century? Is it the Islamic Republic of Iran. <laughs> Iran from went from more to, from over six to one point eight children more rapidly than China did. There was no one child policy. There were huge television debates between the conservative theologians and the liberal theologians. And there was a fairly good Bavar's uh, health system in the villages that made contraceptives available. So if the Islamic Republic of Iran can do it, why can't Pakistan? I think we have one hand up here. Yeah, one hand up here. So everybody's, everybody's getting really excited as we're coming to within three minutes of the end of our <laughs> seminar. So uh, no new hands. Let's see, I saw. Let's do, we can also do questions without answers. <laughs> so uh, let's, let's have, we'll do one question here, and if it's fast, we'll do one more. So um, I admire the desire to increase access to um, contraception and women's rights and also women's education. At the same time, I am really concerned by a group of Westerners going into Africa and telling people what size their family should be, what spread Europe, European, and, and Western values. Um, and I'm concerned about the extent to which this access to education and to contraception comes with a dose of um, marination in Western culture, Western values, and the assumption that those are the correct values to have. I would commit suicide if I ever thought I told a woman how many children she should have. My role is to listen to what women want. I have seen them in tears. I've held them in my arms as they die from an unsafe abortion. That is my motivation. Okay, so on that note, let's stop. <laughs>